today about new content. And we'll just take a minute and set our motivation. If this prayer is familiar to you, you can recite along, or you can just really connect with your sense of spiritual refuge silently to yourself, whichever is more comfortable. So setting our motivation. Was <laughs> Roll up and cheer, sung a droopa show. Sung a churum so he churum la. John Chupa do dani capsuchi. Dagi churn yan gape so nam gay. Roll up and cheer, sung a droopa show. And just allowing that motivation to sink in. Okay, so uh, welcome folks. This session we're going to look a little bit at the symbolism of the art and a little bit of the meaning behind these images that you see in all Tibetan Buddhist centers. You know, what's going on, what is just beauty making, and what is like a mind map to help you anchor your meditation. What is symbolic? Um, it's really important to realize that while in one sense, this is art, it's sacred art, and it's actually coming from the enlightened mind of holy beings, the geometry of it. So if you've ever seen a Tonka painting class or a Tonka painting master, there's a grid behind these images um, with really precise geometry and really precise um, angles, and they use compasses, and it's all actually very technical. And then the artistic expression is shown more in a little bit of the facial features, you know, whether it's a wide face or a narrow face, whether it's got, you know, kind of a more feminine aspect or more male aspect, you can often tell the gender of the artist by looking at the painting and going, I don't think women look like that. But anyway, um, you know, you can kind of tell that uh, people may or may not have a firm understanding of anatomy, but the underneath geometry, like the head tilt and the hand position and the proportions, that all is part of the sacred geometry of Tanka art. And it's a tool to facilitate our meditation practice. So you look at the image, a real one in real life, like this one behind me or the one that was emailed to you, and you get familiar enough with it to know the key features so that you can bring it up in your mind's eye during meditation. So during meditation, you don't look at the picture unless you need to, like hitting refresh on the browser. You know, you, you might need to look for a second to kind of refresh, oh yeah, she's holding this, but then you go back to closing your eyes and bringing it up to your mind's eye. This is the same instruction for if you're doing single pointed meditation on a visualized meditation object, like the moon or a candle or the image of Shakyamuni Buddha. You have an image of Shakyamuni Buddha that you've seen, but then you bring it to your mind's eye. You're not staring at it. You know what the moon looks like, but you're not staring at the moon in your meditation or staring at a candle. So while there is some traditions that have these like open eye staring meditations, that's not us. You're bringing it up to your mind's eye, your memory of it. So one of the unique features of Tantra is that you're developing your single pointed concentration and your analytical abilities simultaneously. In the Sutra path, in our tradition, you develop them as two separate skills that eventually you can bring together when you're a really advanced practitioner. But in Tantra, you're kind of doing this from the outset. So you're bringing together an image and your analysis knows what the image means, at least roughly, even if only compassion, you know, so you see Tara think compassion or see Tara think healing simultaneously. So these are very powerful images and I'm not going to go through every single tiny detail, but I wanted to give you the main points that are important to understand. 
Um, like all uh, Tibetan Buddhist deities, there is the folk story of the deity. Mm -hmm. There's the historical figure who is like representative of that deity's energy, who was a real person. Mm -hmm. And then there's also um, the archetypal energy. Okay, so White Tara's kind of archetypal energy is this compassionate, motherly, healing archetype. Yeah, you know, like the, the nurse in a war zone, soothing your tired brow, <laughs> you know, this kind of energy, but also very strong and courageous. There was a real person who White Tara is attributed to, but White Tara-ness the energy of white Tara is a white Tara energy that exists in all enlightened beings and the seed of it already exists for us. Yeah, already for us. So then the folk story is um, the short version of the folk story. We know about Thousand Arm Chen Rezig, yeah, the Buddha of compassion. So if you look at Thousand Arm Chen Rezig, who's, um, you can't quite tell in this picture because it's not high enough resolution, but in his thousand arms, there's an eye in each of the palms, seeing the suffering of all sentient beings of all directions, holding them in his compassionate gaze. And there's a thought that at one point he said, thousand arms is not enough, I need more action. And he had a tear of compassion flow one from his green face on the side and one, or, and one from his um, white face. So from the green face came green Tara, the tear of compassion. And from the white face came white Tara from a tear of compassion. And there is a story of all of the other faces as well. And that is a story for another day. But if you think that Tara energy, green and white is the action ability of compassion ability of compassion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so from the folk story perspective. So um, Angel was asking about advice for people that don't visualize anything in their mind's eye. Um, people with this, um, you know, there's this percentage of the population that can't visualize. It's just, you know, not an ability that they have, and that's completely fine. What you think is, I think that this is happening, and I'm holding the structure of it. Yeah. So, you know, the, the question is, do you actually have that non-ability of visualizing or is the image just not familiar? So, you know, the question is, can you picture an apple in your mind's eye right now without looking at an apple? If you can, you can visualize Tara. It's just new and it needs more familiarity. If you can't picture an apple in your mind's eye and you have that you know, deficiency, it's, it's not a problem because the main thing is your association with the thoughts of it. So if you're thinking radiant white, you just think literally, I'm holding the idea of radiant white even though I don't see anything. Yeah, and I'm holding the idea of, and I'm holding the idea of, even though I don't see anything, it's fine, it's no problem. Yeah, and the lamas would verify this as well. People ask this in traditional Dharma classes with traditional Tibetan teachers, and I've heard them say this as well. So don't worry if that's not your skill set. All right, so White Tara. Um, we talked about already how the lotus, the sun, and the moon represent the three principal aspects of the path, renunciation, the wisdom of reality, and bodhicitta and that that lotus, sun, and moon can be found all over the place, and that all of the deities are either sitting or standing on that stack. Sometimes the moon cushion is prominent, sometimes the sun cushion is prominent, but they're always both there, even if the artist chose not to show them, even if the sadhana skips over one of them, those three are there. Remind me why those three are there, <laughs> since we talked about it before. Why are all the deities sitting or standing on the three principal aspects of the path? Why is that important with Tantra? Remember? Christina? Oh my, I wrote it in my notes. Oh, you wrote it in your notes. <laughs> the lotus uh, represents renunci renunciation, the sun disk, wisdom realizing, um, wisdom <laughs> and then the moon disc uh, realizing bodhicitta 100%. The wisdom realizing but bodhicitta. why but why 
because <laughs> you need all of those for enlightenment. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Look, it's straightforward, but it can't be forgotten because Tantra is so kind of exotic and fancy and sort of like esoteric and magical and kind of pagan vibes and all the smells and bells. You might forget that the point is enlightenment for others. <laughs> right? This is not like a magic spiritual trip for your own entertainment. This is not an invitation to like play with your chakras. Yeah, this is really the quick path to enlightenment, which means it's hard. Yeah, it's quick because you're gaining so much more merit than the sutra path because of the intensity and the depth. Multitasking is familiar to us as modern people, but it's hard. It takes a lot of mental strength and mental power. Using things that normally tempt us or give us aversion and trying to look at them in a different way is radical. Yeah, it's radical. So, you know, you could kind of get lost in the beauty of it or the exoticness of it and forget that you only want enlightenment quickly because sentient beings need you now. Yeah, if sentient beings didn't need you now, you could just do, 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 you know, work your way up to enlightenment, la la la, you know, <laughs> like take it easy, no worries. Maybe even just stop at Nirvana, hang out there, no problem, just stay out of trouble. Yeah, if, if it weren't for wanting to work for the welfare of sentient beings, there would be no urgency. Yeah, I mean, there'd be a type of urgency because you don't want to suffer, but you could get to a certain point and just kind of hang out there. Yeah, so the reason for Tantra is bodhicitta. The way you achieve Tantra without going into wrong views, renunciation, correct view, bodhicitta. Yeah, renunciation keeps you from being tempted by the pleasures of samsara because you realize that they're temporary, they're problematic, they lead to more suffering in the future. So you can use and enjoy the things on the tantric path without attachment, right? Then the wisdom realizing emptiness, you remember the wisdom realizing emptiness so you don't become fixated on this practice will make me good or a Buddha from its own side, divorced from context. It won't work if you just do it lip service. It only works if all of the dependent arising, all of the causes and conditions come together, the main one being your own mental engagement with it. So sometimes people forget things are empty because they depend and they grasp and say, well, I've been doing my 108 white Tara mantras every day. Why am I sick? As if from their own side, they're a magic spell that will fix you, divorced from your relationship to it and all the other things around it. So the wisdom realizing emptiness prevents fundamentalism, prevents wrong views. And then bodhicitta keeps your heart open and keeps you from getting distracted by all, all of the you know, incredible elaboration of Tantra, all of the interesting experiences that might happen with your energy system through Tantra. You don't get lost in it because you're remembering sentient beings need you. Lama Zopa Rinpoche once told this story of a Yamantaka practitioner who had amazing visualization skills, amazing concentration, but like no bodhicitta and very little renunciation. And because of the power of his practice, he was reborn as a hungry ghost that looked like Yamantaka. <laughs> Right. So, you know, his concentration had an effect, his visualization had an effect, but it was not this positive effect that we're seeking. So, you know, it's, it's important that we kind of remember the reason for these things. So the lotus, sun and moon, get those three in your mind, even if nothing else, because also those three will keep coming up every single deity that you work on. Yeah. Any question on those three before we go into anything else? Need to flesh it out at all, it's clear enough. Okay, so specific to white Tara. So why is she white? Remembering white, not Caucasian, right? Radiant white like the moon. Um, this kind of white usually represents cleansing or purification. 
Yeah. So we think, especially in the visualization, that this is very much a purification because you're purifying all the negative karma that would create untimely death or would create illness. Um, we're pur purifying things that could shorten our lifespan, such as degeneration of the elements in the body or the life force being stolen or broken ethical restraints, broken precepts, broken commitments. All these things can shorten our life. And um, the white color indicates the purification of those things. So in some of the prayers, you know, particularly the Amitaya section, when you're like hooking back the life force from destructive beings and hooking back from your own, you know, mistakes, etc. cetera. Um, here is a time where you either could go a little superstitious or you could go a little bit, um, this sounds like silly nonsense. <laughs> yeah, depending on your previous associations, right? So some people get really superstitious and they think, oh, people are stealing my life force, you know? And it's like, chill out, not usually, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not usually. People are sucking my will to live. You're like, no, you're just tired. Like have a nap, you'll be fine, okay? <laughs> so don't get weird about it. Yeah, but that's not to say there aren't a few rare cases where the karmic connection between you and someone who has a really strong negative habituation, mm -hmm. as well as a very strong negative spiritual path, mm -hmm. might be able to do something harmful to you through their spiritual practice, mm -hmm. their so-called spiritual practice that is lacking ethics. Mm -hmm. So there are very rare cases of this. It doesn't happen very often. You have to have a very strong connection with them karmically. They have to have a very strong practice of it and they have to want to be taking it. Mm. Yeah. So it's not like empathic distress, you know, like if you're hanging out with someone who's got really heavy vibes and they're really depressed. And then after you're with them, you're totally exhausted. They haven't taken your life force. You have empathic distress. You know, you've been upregulated by bearing witness to their suffering because you forgot compassion, yeah? You might've called it compassion and might even go into that kind of, I don't know, psychology today nonsense that says there is compassion fatigue. There is no such thing as compassion fatigue because compassion cannot be fatigued. And there's even been um, science done on this where um, I think it was maybe Miguel Rinpoche or Mathieu Ricard, and they hooked up all sorts of electrodes to their brain while they were doing compassion meditation and showed the incredible energy and sustainability of that mindset. However, empathic distress totally happens. So we might call it, I have compassion for them, that's why I'm tired. But you were just bearing witness to the suffering and also probably feeling powerless to help it. Mm -hmm. Compassion is bearing witness to the suffering and bearing witness to their potentiality to be free from it. Mm -hmm. You're not identifying them with it. And so you're not exhausted by seeing it. Does that make sense? Okay, so when we're talking about people who are stealing your life force, it's not your depressed friend, okay? <laughs> right? And if it feels like your depressed friend, go back to your own work and think, do I need better boundaries? Shall I activate compassion instead of empathic distress? That's your own business and your own work, yeah? Better boundaries, more compassion, it'll be fine, okay? Um, so people with stealing life force, there's that. It can happen, but not that often. Don't freak out. Okay. Um, the other piece is whenever you take life, you know, you clean the kitchen and you wiped over ants, that does plant the seed for shortened life and illness. Mm -hmm. So every action of killing is planting those seeds and we have tons of them. So we want to purify that. Yeah. I mean, how many years were we walking around killing stuff before we came across Buddhism? We might have been one of those sweet kids who had ant farms and loved them and nourished them. Or we might have been one of those kind of dodgy kids that saw ants and was like, I shall stamp you and burn you with my magnifying glass. No judgment, right? Like we all have a mixed bag of karma. But acknowledge that you probably have a great deal of karma for a shortened life and for illness, even if it's not from your particular life right now, even if in this particular life you were a nice kid. We've all been the dodgy kid some lifetime in the past. So her white color purifying you, this is really good news for us. And um, it's a nice association to have. 
So then we have this Utpala flower um, blooming by her left ear. And the Utpala flower is connected with bodhisattvas because they have their roots in the mud but are unstained by the mud. In the same way a bodhisattva appears in our samsaric realm, but is not overwhelmed by the pollution, the mental pollution and degeneration of our samsaric realm. So when you think of the Utpala flower or the lotus flower, you can add those symbolisms to it. And you think determination, strength, discipline to grow out of the mud and be unstained in the mud and yet able to be of benefit to other sentient beings. So these, um, the symbolism of the white and the symbolism of the Utpala flower, this is from um, Venerable Bhikshuni Tupton Chudran, who's a very senior nun in our tradition. And she is very good about checking her sources. There's a lot of great white Tara information on Venerable Tupton Chudran's website, as well as guided meditations and stuff. So if you want more, um, Google her, her website's great. Mm -hmm. Um, shifting gears, then what's the deal with her seven eyes? Yeah, so you see, you know, her forehead, she's got um, right above her third eye, there's an extra literal eye. And then in the palm of her hand, and on the soles of her feet, and then her other hand, and of course, just her regular eyes. <laughs> yeah, so she's got all these extra eyes. Some deities have this, some don't. Tara has seven eyes. Um, so the three eyes on her face, the third eye in her forehead, these symbolize her ability to see the unity of ultimate reality. While her two other eyes simultaneously see the relative and dualistic worlds. So she's able to see relative truth and ultimate truth simultaneously. Of course, all Buddhas can see relative truth and ultimate truth simultaneously, but there's some important meaning by visually depicting that. And I think it's very important for us to understand the relationship between relative truth and ultimate truth. Mm -hmm. So ultimate truth is the emptiness of all phenomena. Relative truth is generally speaking worldly conventions. Mm -hmm. So worldly conventions on the basis of which we develop the ethics of non-harmfulness, right? We want to refrain from killing and stealing and sexual misconduct and all the things that hurt ourselves and others. But then they're all empty of inherent existence. So how do you hold those two things? The fact that there is positive actions, negative actions, there is karma created, there is karma experienced, and nothing is good or bad from its own side. Yeah. And so she's able to hold those parallel truths, one of which is deceptive, one of which is accurate. But we live in the deceptive truth and have to develop ethics on the basis of this deceptive truth. And she sees what we're up to. And because she sees the relative and the ultimate simultaneously, she understands all of our past lives, all of why we do what we do, all of our choices right now, and has complete acceptance, compassion, and love. Yeah, no judgment whatsoever, no negative judgment. Mm. And she also knows that these mistakes we've made are not our nature. These mistakes we made are removable. Mm. So she just kind of have that sense of her seeing simultaneously our cloudy appearances and the clarity. Mm. So it's not like she's just living in clarity, not able to relate to us. She can relate to us because she sees the mess that we're in exactly and precisely. So those eyes are quite per um, powerful. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yes. <laughs> the question from the Gamba was, could you go back over ultimate truth? <laughs> and of course, I was like, nothing to see here. La, 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 la. That's a large conversation. Yeah. Um, ultimate truth is emptiness. That's the short answer. And you're like, all right. <laughs> but we're talking about what emptiness of a certain characteristic so all phenomena people um you know physical objects situations everything whatsoever lacks inherence it's empty of inherence meaning that it doesn't have this independent existence that is self-creating it doesn't spontaneously make itself things don't um 
have their own characteristics, we pick out characteristics and attribute a label there. So relative truth is deceptive, but relative truth is all we know because of the influence of ignorance, right? So right now for us, things appear truly existent. They look that way, they seem that way, they feel that way. If you feel uncomfortable with someone, you assume it's because they are a bad person and they are harming you. And that is the whole story. And then after a couple beats of reflection, one, two, three, you think, okay, 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 okay. Words are not the source of harm. My relationship to the words has given me receptor sites to feel harmed. My negative karma is ripening in response to these conditions. People who do harmful things are hurting. And you remember all sorts of cliches like hurt people, hurt people, you know? And you're like, yes, okay, yes, okay, context, context. And that helps you expand the appearance to contain more possibilities. You haven't realized emptiness, but you've had a better picture of relative truth and that decreases your mental suffering and your own reactivity. So ultimate truth is the fact that friends, enemies, strangers, everything, these are not self-existent labels. They're labels we attribute, yeah. And they really seem true. And we have to consciously remind ourselves again and again, it appears inherently existent, but it lacks inherent existent. It appears this way, but that's not how it is. So remembering the ultimate truth of things is something that we have to do intentionally at our level, but through repetition, it will become spontaneous and it will help cut all of our negative habits. It's a very good, efficient antidote for pretty much all the stress in your life. If you've done a little study about it, it really helps. Yeah, because as soon as you get gripped onto a story, it helps you release it. Yeah, helps you release it. Just, you know, this is a great day, not from its own side. This is a terrible day, not from its own side. <laughs> yeah, merely labeled by the mind, merely labeled by the mind. Then you can enjoy it or you can bear it, but you're not fixated on it. So it's a long conversation, but yeah, it's, it's a good one to keep coming back to ultimate truth. Oh. Right. So um, then she has one eye in each palm of her hands and feet, showing that all her actions, right? The movement of the limbs, all her actions are governed by her ultimate wisdom and compassion. So everything she does, all the movements she makes are with this understanding of ultimate truth, engaging with relative truth. And it's said that White Tara's seven eyes enable her to clearly see all beings in all the realms of existence. Her expression is one of utmost compassion. So this is from His Eminence Gar Garchen Rinpoche, who is a very senior Lama who teaches really regularly online and he has excellent translators. So if you're wanting more from Garchen Rinpoche, see the Rigzin Dharma um, Foundation, they're good folks. Um, so ultimately she's the very nature of the Dharmakaya. So I think we should talk a little bit about the Dharmakaya. Does anyone have a sense of what the Dharmakaya is already? When you hear that word, the Dharmakaya? or the truth body, what is that? Is it a new word to everybody or have you heard it kind of floating around and you're like, sort of vaguely, I know, but not really, you have kind of a general something? Any impressions, just kind of not in precise language, just, I think it's this, brave people. Not brave. Not brave, yeah, no, that's okay, <laughs> that's okay. Um, the short answer, is that it's uh, the wisdom truth body of the Buddha or of all the Buddhas. So sometimes we say the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas. And it's helpful to think of it a little bit like the ocean and each drop in the ocean is a Buddha that became enlightened. So the ocean, you can't really pick out each drop right and say oh look there's you know sam back in the 18th century he's a buddha now look plop you know you can't kind of pull them all out like that but they were all individual mental continuums yeah every single buddha had their own individual mental continuum exactly like us 
they had a clear and knowing consciousness, they had innate ignorance, they had Buddha nature. They overcome their ignorance, they develop their Buddha nature to its utmost extent. Their clear and knowing consciousness enabled them to do that. They had those three things exactly like us, and they developed their mind to its utmost extent and became enlightened. And once you're enlightened, you have the same abilities as every single enlightened being, but you don't have the same karmic connection as every other one. So we have a karmic connection with Shakyamuni Buddha because we've met his teachings, but it's not like he's the only Buddha there ever was, right? He's the, what, the fourth Buddha of this fortunate eon um, in the sense of arising and saying, I am a Buddha and I'm going to teach the whole path. There's, of course, could be a Buddha right next to you in your house. It might just be in the shape of your cat. You know, we can't tell who is a Buddha and who isn't. But some of them are able to manifest in the full Nirmanakaya form and teach the whole path because of the karma of the students. Not because you suddenly got a nice one who decided to teach. They all want to show us the way to heal ourselves. They all want to show us the way to develop completely, but they can't always. Why? Us. So this is where we get the question of why do I need to become a Buddha if there are already many Buddhas? And it's because you have a karmic connection with the people in your life and your family and your coworkers, and they might hear things from you that they would not hear from anyone else. Yeah, your karmic connection with them facilitates some sort of movement, some sort of powerful condition. So each of these Buddhas has a particular karmic connection with certain affinities of sentient beings. And so from beginningless time until now, we've kind of developed certain habits, which make us fall into one of the Buddha families. And we could say there are five Buddha families or there are five Buddha personality types, ways that our mind has been trending. So it's not to say our minds are like inherently one of these quote families, but our mental habits have developed in such a way that certain qualities come more naturally than others due to habituation. Which is why when you look around in the gompa, some of the tankas you're like, oh, wow. And some of them you don't even notice and they might've been there for years and you've seen them a hundred times and they never registered. It could be the artist, could be the lighting, but it also could be that your karmic connection with that deity isn't as strong. Yeah. So it's, it's just interesting things to explore. So the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas, like a great big ocean full of Buddhas will manifest in a way that suits you given your karma. So the Dharmakaya mind of the Buddhas will manifest as white Tara for you. So all of the Buddhas could manifest as white Tara. We even visualize all the Buddhas as white Tara in the Sadhana. But that doesn't mean that they're all only white Tara. Yeah, they could then say, okay, now Medicine Buddha. Okay, now Manjushri. Because the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas is pervading all of space is formless, colorless, expansive, and then can take the form of a Sambhogakaya ax aspect, which is the form body of a Buddha, Sambhogakaya. Yeah, Christina. So this is where I get confused, because I, when you started talking, I know there's the Nirmanakaya, the Sambhogakaya, and then there's the Dharmakaya, and I always get them confused. And you had mentioned the Nirmanakaya, and then I was thinking, oh, that's the physical body. But then you just said Sambhogakaya. So what's the difference? What's Nirmanakaya again? Yes, Kaya clarification. There are four Kayas. Ah. <laughs> Sometimes we say there are three. Sometimes we I say there know. are two. Sometimes we say two, meaning wisdom and form. Sometimes we say three, meaning wisdom in general, and the two kinds of form, Nirmanakaya and Sambhogakaya are both form bodies. Uh -huh. So Sambhogakayas can be seen by only Arya Bodhisattvas. They're the only ones who have the karma to see them, which is why we need to be able to also have the full Nirmanakaya aspect that's accessible to all sentient things. So there's two. <clears throat> um, so anyway, so there's two form bodies, right? Sambhogakaya and Nirmanakaya. If we were to translate them into English, Sambhogakaya is the quote, enjoyment body. Mm. Nirmanakaya is the emanation body. Okay, so, but one is accessible to only Arya Bodhisattvas, one is accessible to all sentient beings. The two wisdom bodies, 
So you could say Dharmakaya truth body, but there's also the Swavikakaya, which is the nature truth body, which is present once the emptiness of your mind has met with all of the other conditions of becoming a fully enlightened Buddha. So it's like your natural Buddha nature. And that Swavavika Kaya, that nature truth body, that's where people get confused and think you're already a Buddha, but you just need to wake up to it. Because mm. that natural Buddha nature is always with you because your mind has always lacked inherent existence, which is why it can change and develop, which is fantastic news. So that is not a Buddha body until the rest of the bodies come into play. Yeah, until you've realized emptiness directly, until you've finished accumulation of merit, once you've done all of the work to become a Buddha, that emptiness of your mind becomes the nature truth body, the Swabhava Kakaya. So it's a division into four, but usually we use the shorthand of the two, yeah, wisdom and form. Sometimes we say three, and we just kind of neglect that second truth body because that's the one that doesn't need any work. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. the other three need work to accomplish, mm -hmm. but the nature truth body is just hanging out there ready to kick in once we've accomplished all the other tasks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, so these are all kind of heady topics, I realize, and they're kind of scholarly, but it's nice to know that they exist. You don't have to do a deep dive into them if it's not your area of interest, but know that those topics exist if you're curious. And if you want to know more about the Buddha bodies, that's in the Tathagata Garbha, in the Buddha nature um, tradition of the Buddhist path. So the basic program has a Tathagata Garbha module, takes about six weeks. Mm -hmm. And there's a text from Maitreya that we study there, and it's lovely. Mm -hmm. So um, the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas pervades everywhere. That's the thing to know. Yeah. So the mind of the Buddhas is everywhere, all the time always with you. Sometimes you can feel the Buddhas when you're receptive and open. Most of the time we're feeling isolated and alone and sort of like, mm. <laughs> but you know, when you're open to it, you can feel the fact that they're there bearing witness to your life, rooting you on, knowing all of your mess, knowing all of your possibilities. And whenever your karma is ready for it, they're right in there to try and give you conditions for you to ripen your own mind. Mm -hmm. okay. so that's um the main things about tara to know um there's you know there's things about her groovy clothes there's things about her ornaments those are not just for pretty those are all symbolic as well there's things about her halos all of this you know for another time but the main thing is to understand about the white about the eyes and about the lotus sun and moon so then when we do this part of the sadhana where there's these like layers of protection, these circles of protection, we talked yesterday about the mantra circles. So I'm gonna skip over these first few rings and go to the last six rings, okay? So these circles of protection, they invite qualities, support and ability, okay? So we've got peace is white, increase is yellow, red is power, dark blue is wrath, green is enlightened activity, magenta is stability, but in our sadhana it says brown, some sadhanas say copper, that's the one that's variable. The other colors are standard in all sadhanas, you're gonna find those colors depicting those qualities. A very cool thing about white Tara practice is that it's starting to talk about highest yoga tantra things like increase power and wrath are not usually explicitly taught in lower tantra usually just peace pacification yeah and enlightened activity is kind of the um, the wheelhouse of all taras you know all forms of tara the 21 taras green tara chitamani tara white tara so enlightened activity makes sense but then we have this addition of stability and the stability is something that really in this case, just think of it as anchoring all of the others, okay? So what I wanted to do the deep dive into was these four, peace, increase, power, and wrath. And you know, if we do a little zoom into the circles, you can kind of see, here we go, white, peace, yellow, increase, red, power, dark blue, wrath, or destruction, green, enlightened activity, magenta, stability. Okay, so there they are there, and that image has been emailed to you. Um, yeah, go ahead, Dave. Uh, when you envision these 
um, films with color. How thick are they? Are they filled with that color? Yeah, Dave was asking, you know, how thick are these rings? Are they filled with color? They are radiant made of light, made of transparent light. And I, I'm trying to remember what the commentary says. And I cannot remember what the commentary says off the top of my head in terms of thickness. But I think, you know, if you're imagining kind of about a foot, that's probably a good amount, about a foot of light. But put a pin in that, double check the commentary. And that's a good opportunity to remind you guys that there's an amazing commentary on White Tara. But please only read it once you have the empowerment. The things that I'm talking about this weekend are okay for a general audience who has respect for Buddhism um, and respect for Tantra. This isn't something that I would necessarily teach to a non-Buddhist audience. You really need to have respect for Tantra and respect for Buddhism, but it's okay for a general audience to hear. Some of the things I'm not talking about because they're for people with empowerment only. So if you have the empowerment, once you have the empowerment, um, there's a book called The Healing Nectar of Immortality, mm. and it's a commentary by Trijong Rinpoche, who is the author of this sadhana, and it's been translated into English by David Gonzalez, and it's a really wonderful translation. So The Healing Nectar of Immortality by Trijong Rinpoche, um, and it's published by Daichin Ling Press, and it's only available in um, hard copy. You can't get it electronically. Um, unless you do something dodgy online, and please don't. <laughs> okay, but um, so the healing nectar of immortality, Trijan Rinpoche, after you have the empowerment, tons of detail, amazing, yeah. Um, there's a few other ones, but I think, you know, if you're just kind of warming up into it, look at Tupton Children's website, she's got really excellent material there. So I'm sorry, I can't give you a more definitive answer about the, the width of the circles, but they're made of light. They're all made of light. And the whole thing feel like it's made of light and is really vivid. You sometimes hear me saying it's bright like um, the sun reflected off snow mountains. That's an image that's often given to us. But if you wanna be more modern, you could think like headlights on high beam, you know, like it is bright light, yeah. And the brighter you can make the light of your visualization, the easier it is to stay awake, okay? And if you're a little bit anxious and a little hyped up, you can also kind of cool it down a little and settle the brightness if your mind is a little bit agitated. But generally speaking, it's really vivid light. Okay, so peace, the power of peace, increase the power of increase, what are these things meaning and what's the deal there? So, the peace aspect, this is the power of pacification. And this is an ability we need in order to benefit sentient beings. And I think it's common sense because you know, sometimes you wanna be the peacemaker. Sometimes you feel there is conflict, there is agitation, and you just wanna, you know, get everyone to just settle. And so the power of peace kind of like snuffs out the fuel for conflict snuffs it out. Um, and so this pacification ability and this peaceful making ability, this is something that almost all Kriya Tantra deities help us invoke. This is quite common throughout. What's not usually as implied is the others. They're sometimes in there, but very quietly. And they're a little bit more confusing. <laughs> so I'm guessing the idea of creating the power of peace seems like a nice good idea. But do you want to ask anything about that before we go to the other three? Power of peace. One of the qualities that gets developed by practicing Tara. Good. Okay, so increase yellow. Yeah, the power of increase. This is like abundance. Okay, and the way in which you might get confused is you think, aren't Buddhists trying to practice contentment? Why do Buddhists need stuff? <laughs> right? And then, you know, you might be in a Zen temple and it's like really simple and there's like one tiny Buddha and like one tiny flower and then everything is black and you're like, oh, chill. And then you walk into a Tibetan Buddhist kampa and it's like a color explosion and like there is no sort of aesthetic about, wow, are those two colors next to each other? All right, that's not what I would expect. Why not? Okay. You know, and it's just like, <laughs> right. And you think, 
I, this seems kind of materialistic and there's like shiny things and there's gold and what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some of that is cultural aesthetic. Some of that is related to the minds of the beings who Buddhism entered into, you know, Buddhism coming to Japan, it was already a busy, crowded place. You want a bit more simplicity. Tibetan uh, culture, you know, has a lot of expansive landscapes, a lot of spaciousness. So having a crowded gampa is not so overwhelming. That's true. But in terms of this power of increase and abundance, what we're trying to do is overcome our deprivation mentality. We get into this feeling of I don't have enough and I'm not good enough. I don't have enough and I'm not enough. And so to kind of overcome this, we need to kind of fill up with this right yellow energy of increase, but really this sense of, well, what do I want though? I want enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. What is required for the enlightenment that I seek? A mind. <laughs> I have one, so I'm fine. Tick. Yeah, check that box. All right, what else do I want? I want conducive conditions to access the resources I need to support my path. You know, I need access to education. I need access to time and space. Can I get those things happening in my life? Can I simplify my life enough to be filled with the abundance of practice resources? Probably yes. Probably yes. Um, you know, so you just kind of do these checking in with what are you feeling deprived of exactly? Are those things that you're actually deprived of or actually need? This is a nice just sutra meditation on contentment. But with the power of increase, you're almost feeling like you have so much that you're so flooded and so full that it radiates out and sharing comes so naturally. Yeah, you don't think, oh, this is mine. No, <laughs> you feel so full with abundance that you're radiating out. Yeah, so it's not about the stuff. It's about the feeling of enough. It's not about then you feeling not good enough. You're feeling like I have everything I need for perfection. Thank you very much. I'm fine. Yes, but so too everyone else. So then no competitiveness. No, you have more than me, less than me. It's like we all have a mind equally capable of enlightenment. I am not better than the dung beetle. The giant llama is not better than me. It's just all stages on the same path. So it makes no sense to look down on myself. It makes no sense to look down on others. We're all just working through it, given our conditions, but our abilities or our potentialities are the same. So the power of increase gives this back to you. And I think that when you're with people, the power of increase gives them the feeling of enoughness. Yeah, and this is really what we're trying to do for sentient beings is help them feel I have enough. Yeah. It also can increase lifespan. It can increase general resources. And you're also wanting to increase like realizations. So it has that connotation as well, this power of increase. Mm -hmm. um, and then power, red. Okay, so here power means kind of, it, sometimes it's called controlling. And that you know, is dangerous, right? We don't want to be <laughs> controlling and we don't want to dominate people and be, you know, gross like that, right? That's not what we're about. It's not about some sort of authoritarian regime that we're trying to develop internally. It's just this power is knowing that you are empowered. Yeah, that people cannot, what, what is that famous Eleanor Roosevelt quote? Um, no one can make you feel less than without your consent, mm -hmm. something like that. It's like you have Buddha nature, feel the power of that, radiate that out. This is also one of these things, this power aspect that we're cultivating on the path. Also it has a, a quality of like bringing projects to fruition and kind of cutting through unnecessary obstacles. Yeah, so, you know, like, have you ever been in a staff meeting and you've got a really good agenda, but then it gets completely sidetracked by someone's like random thought? Yeah, so I mean, if you had this power fully integrated, you could help them feel loved and acknowledged and validated and get them to shut up quickly. 
yeah, while still feeling, lo feeling loved and in no way oppressed. Yes, and then get the job done, the big picture job done and like whoosh, like that, so power, yeah. And when it's said controlling, it means controlling disturbing emotions. It doesn't mean controlling people, right? It means subduing uh, their disturbing emotions and your own. And that's what ties into then wrath, which is the most dangerous one. And it's sometimes translated as the power of destruction. And this one is, um, it, it's one of these ones where the lamas almost never recommend you use wrath, almost never, unless you have bodhicitta like realized bodhicitta mm -hmm. so when you're doing the visualization you're aspiring to use wrath correctly if it's ever needed when it's ever needed but you're not then leaving the cushion thinking now i shall be wrathful because i'm empowered to do so mm -hmm. don't touch it unless you actually have bodhicitta because what is wrath it looks like anger but it's not yeah it looks like fierceness it looks like the most dominating energy possible, but it's so loving. And there's a few teachers in our tradition who seem to have wrath under control. Like, I don't know, maybe Venerable Rabina, like she can shout at you and you feel like loved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right for some people depends on your karma with her right <laughs> but um you know <laughs> like i remember her saying to me once something like yinton why are you doing that that's so stupid and i laughed and i was like you're right that was so stupid like i was not hurt but someone else saying that same thing to me i would have been like you know or they don't like me or how dare you but like when she said it i was like <laughs> yep <laughs> that was dumb <laughs> Yeah, so wrath can look like anger, but it doesn't feel like anger. It's fierce, but it's not mean. Yeah. And so destructive, what are you destroying? You're destroying obstacles. You're destroying the things that prevent progress. And so sometimes I use that analogy of a, like a wise firefighter who knows when the fire needs to burn and when the fire needs to be stopped. Sometimes the fire needs to burn and sometimes it needs to be prevented. And an excellent firefighter knows where and when. And that's that kind of wrath where sometimes the destruction allows for new growth. Sometimes the destruction prevents further destruction, but you need so much wisdom and so much bodhicitta to actually use this. So don't <laughs> until you have those, yeah. A any questions about wrath? That's, that's the trickiest one. And that's the one when you read it in the Sadhana and you're like, and may I have the power of destruction? And you're like, really, should I? I don't know. <laughs> the rest of them, you're like, all right. But um, questions about that one, thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. So am I on being brave? Yes, good, brave. Okay. So in the empowerment that I took, we just you know, went through the 21 emotions. So I guess my question is, so this white star is special because we're also invoking that, and maybe I'm saying wrongly, this um, wrathful protection, protection ability, yep. Ability. And so really it's just, it's part of this. It's part of her, it's part of her whole thing. Yeah. So it's okay, obviously, to do the practice and which is not, you know, it's, it's just for protection. It's for protection and it's for, I, I, you know, the confusion seems to be like, why this special ability and quality in the white Tara practice that you don't see in other Tara practices explicitly? And, you know, part of it is that in this white Tara practice, you want a long, healthy life and you need powerful methods to achieve a long, healthy life. With regular Tara, of course, you're aiming for enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, but a lot of the plans are more immediate, like may I have swift action, may I have protection from this and protection from that. And so it's, you don't kind of need that same ongoing like force field, for lack of a better word. Or it's just, it's a different tool. You know, it's not like one is higher or lower. It's, you know, green Tara is a lot more about leaping to the aid of sentient beings. White Tara is sitting, she doesn't have one foot out, and she's holding this space, very protected, stable in the center, and also cutting up all of these obstacles that might prevent her full long life, or our full long life. So when we're thinking about all these layers of protection, 
they're also inviting layers of ability. So it's not just health and long life, it's also vitality in that healthy long life and ability in that healthy long life, all for the aim of working for the welfare of sentient beings. So as long as you keep steady on the point of all of this is in order to work for the welfare of all sentient beings, you're probably gonna be fine. And in the sadhana itself, just kind of do what the visualization says and see what happens. Just kind of see what happens, kind of let go and see what happens. Cause some of it makes sense and has a logic and you've studied about. And so there's a resonance right away and the rest of it will come over time and might need more commentary, but it's kind of like, let's just see. Cause probably we're enough into the Dharma at this point that we assume it's a good recipe for this. But um, think layers of protection, inviting layers of ability, both. Yeah, both. All right, any, anything else about the practice? Next session, we'll just do the practice. We might have a tiny bit of time for Q&A, but um, are there any hanging questions before we have a tea break? Yeah. It looks like Patty um, put a question in the uh, chat about um, the link to the description, and I was trying to find it on, I think it was tiptonchildren.org. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if you just Google um, Tuptin Children White Tara, you'll find um, okay. stuff. I, I'll put that in there. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, and her book on green Tara talks about many Tara qualities that are universal. So How to Free Your Mind by Tuptin Children, really excellent book. Yeah. All right, folks, um, doing all right, enough to process. I'll send you those handouts um, as part of the follow-up email later and um, or um, Catherine or Christina will, and we'll dedicate and then next session we'll do the practice. So let's dedicate. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that is not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Okay, so see you in a half hour for practice.